want to welcome you to part three of the Keys to Living Like You've Been Saved workshop. Today we're going to be talking about generational sins and cultivated bondage. So before we begin, I invite, uh, want to invite Yahweh's presence with us, so please bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together and ask that your presence would be here through your Rahok Kadesh, your Holy Spirit. Lead and guide and direct us into all truth, Heavenly Father. And as today, especially as we consider this topic of, of generational sins and cultivated bondage, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll give us eyes to see, spiritual eyes to see, and spiritual ears to listen, and that we may get discernment from your word and, and not just knowledge, but understanding, Heavenly Father, and how you can uh, not only point these things out in our lives, but Heavenly Father, how you, through your the atoning blood of Yeshua HaMashiach can set us free from all defilements. I pray again that you'll be with Sean and myself as we speak, Heavenly Father. May we only speak that which is edifying to your body is our prayer in Yeshua's name. Amen. So you may be wondering, you know, you have Passover and you get all the leaven out at Passover. What do you need the week of unleavened bread for, right? There's no more leaven to get out, is there? Well, actually, Passover is when you get out all the known leaven, but remarkably, leaven sneaks up on us. And so the reason there is a whole week of unleavened bread beyond is because Yahweh wants to enlighten our understanding to areas of leaven we wouldn't have formerly noticed. So you get out all the known leaven yesterday, and now... This week, as we are going into the Keys Workshop, maybe Yahweh will be revealing to you some hidden areas of leaven. And we want to pray to have the eyes to see it. Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Many ask, why do we need to have the devices of the enemies of the enemy be unmasked. It's found here in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, meaning we, for we are, not, we are not to be ignorant of our devices. So our ignorance becomes his advantage. If we don't understand that we are dealing with a spiritual conflict, what will we do? We'll fall, we'll, we'll, we'll fall prey to it. We'll fight flesh and blood. We'll do everything wrong and not hit the spiritual battle straight on as we should. So our ignorance uh, really is a defeated attitude. Um, we are to, to know what the devil's up to. Also, we need to be aware of what Satan is up to in tempting us in the first place. Um, there's a saying that on a poster that my children used to have on the homeschool wall. And it had this picture of a hand dropping some coins down. And the, the caption on the poster read, Sin wouldn't be so attractive if its wages were paid immediately. That's true, isn't it? What are the wages of sin? Yeah. Death, that's right. And when the devil is tempting us, his purpose in doing so is to bring us into bondage. That's not very exciting, is it? And so knowing that the enemy desires to enslave us, we have the warning in Galatians 5.1, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Once we have been made free in Yeshua, it is also through his power that we can stay free. In John 8 verse 36, we are told that Yeshua is the one that breaks the chains. It says in John 8 36, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. All right, would you turn with us now to your workbook? We're going to be in session three, which starts on page 15. And the writing part actually starts on page 16. You'll see a little tombstone there. And um, the caption says, three chains that bind our souls to death. There are three ways that Satan causes us to be enslaved. And so we want to recognize what they are. And, of course, once we know what they are, the next step will be then how to deal with them. So the first chain that binds our soul to death, uh, I want to point out what's in the heart there. It says in Psalms 30, verse 2 to 3, O Yahweh, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Yahweh, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Isn't that good? 
because our chains, these chains that Satan puts upon us do bind us to the grave in an eternal way. All right, the first chain, you can put it up on the line that says A, is inherited bondage. We hear, read about that in Exodus 20, verse 5, where it says, I, Yahweh, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the who? Children. Children, that's inherited bondage. Until the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Of course, you know the rest that it says, but he shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments, which means we can be delivered from the chains of inherited bondage. But we need to know they're real aren't they? Okay. The next one is cultivated bondage. And cultivated bondage happens over time as we are tempted and we fall prey to the tempter and act on those temptations. James 1, 14 to 15 says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? death, which is why we have said it, that these are three chains that bind our souls to death. In every case, if these chains remain, we will die. Okay? So we, we need deliverance in Yeshua from all these. And the third chain is transferred bondage. Transferred bondage happens through relationships. And Mark and I often say that there is no force more powerful for blessing in our lives than godly relationships. And conversely, there is no force more powerful for our destruction than ungodly relationships. And so it says in 1 Samuel 18 verse 1, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. This bonding of souls is a deep issue. We're not actually going to be talking about that in this session. We'll be talking about it more in the next one. But those are the three chains. In Proverbs 5, uh, 22 to 23, we read, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. So we see the connection between sin and bondage, don't we? And what is sin? Transgression of the law. Sin is transgression of the law. Very interesting. We see a lot of ministries and, and people who believe in spiritual warfare, but they don't believe in the law of Yahweh. They believe it was nailed to the cross. If you believe that the law of Yahweh is not for our lives of value today, other than a historical document, I guess, um, it's actually very deadly in a spiritual warfare scenario because we are holden with the cords of our sins. Amen. Lawlessness. Okay. Also, there is a physical principle on this earth of sowing and reaping. If we go outside and we sow seeds of corn out there, what are we going to get? Corn. corn. And if we sow pumpkins, we're going to get pumpkins. When you sow something, you're going to reap it. And in the same way, spiritually, when you sow in righteousness by his grace, you reap a harvest of blessings. And when you sow in evil and wickedness, you reap curses. You want to know what the blessings and curses are? You can look in Deuteronomy 28, verse 6. There's a little highlight up there. Hosea 10, verse 12 to 13 says, Sow to yourselves in what? Righteousness. Righteousness, good seed. Then you'll reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Yahweh till he come and rain righteousness upon you, referring to the latter rain. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. This talks, this verse actually is also a warning against pride. And it's hard to see, but uh, not that hard since we're New Testament Christians, right? And we have the gift of Yeshua HaMashiach. So when it says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, who's righteous? Any of you righteous here? Yeshua. Only Yeshua. So as you sow to yourselves in righteousness, this isn't what you're doing, it's what Yeshua is doing through you. And if you're in control, he's not. Do you hear me? If you're in control, he's not. So it's sowing yourselves, sow to yourselves in his righteousness, reaping 
his mercy. Remember, you're part of his body. Whether you accept that calling or not is your choice. But the reality is, as soon as you recognize that you are part of the body of Yeshua, you will sow to yourselves in his righteousness and in his mercy. And then if you have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, have eaten of the fruit of the lies, what are you doing? These are all conditions of a prideful heart. If pride is there, and look at this great Babylon which I have built, rather than, wow, look at what Yeshua is doing. I'm humbled and just so appreciative of what he's doing, not in only in my life, but in those he puts me in contact with, then he gets all the honor and the glory. That's righteousness. Job 4, verse 7 to 8 says, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished, being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off, even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness, do what? So if you feel like in your life that you are reaping iniquity and wickedness, what's wrong? You are sowing it. You're sowing it. If you're not being treated the way you wish you were to be treated, what's happening? Check and make sure you're treating others. Follow the second great command. Love others as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Whoever needs help. Mm. Whoever needs help. Oh, that's just outside your family though, right? No, everyone. Oh, no, 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 not everyone. Just outside your family. Whoever. My family I can treat however I want. You two quit arguing. I'm, I'm right. <laughs> okay. No, it's everyone. Dare I say, especially our family, especially those that are in your own household, because that's where it starts. We have to remember in the, in the whole aspect of sowing and reaping, where does righteousness start in our families or in our churches? Families. It starts in our families. Yeah. And even before our families, it starts in us individually. So it starts with us, goes to our families. You want a strong ministry? Have a strong family. If you don't have a strong ministry, it's probably because you don't have a strong family. True. That's how it works, folks. Sowing and reaping, principle, very important. The principles of Deuteronomy 28, which is breaking down the blessings and the cursings, they all still apply to this day. It says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 9 to 13, Yahweh shall establish thee, unholy people, unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of Yahweh thy God, and walk in his ways, and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of Yahweh, and they shall be afraid of thee, Yahweh shall open unto thee his good treasure to bless all the work of thine hand and Yahweh shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of Yahweh thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. What sort of harvest do we reap if we sow in righteousness? That's quite a harvest, isn't it? A harvest of blessing. Okay, so we're on page 17 of our workbook, and uh, we'll begin to fill in this, the fruits of the chains, the undeniable signs of spiritual bondage. First, we will not succeed in our careers. These are all found From, in Deuteronomy 28, verses 14 to 16. If we sow a sinful harvest, what will we reap? We just read the blessings that you reap if you are walking in obedience with Yahweh and forgiven for your past lawlessness. But here we have evidence of bondage. Remember we read in Proverbs how we are held in, in the cords of our own iniquities. And these are how those cords look. These are how they manifest. So Deuteronomy 28, verses 14 to 16, 68, these are actually all the curses that happen. Again, the idea of the wrong spirit, the wrong fruit. So first of all, you will not succeed. We will not su uh, succeed in our own careers. That's in verse 16. Uh, jumping over here to verse 22, um, our, our health will fail. In verse 20, we are told that people in circumstances will plague us. 
Nothing we do, according to verse 19, nothing we do will prosper. Now, prosperity isn't about what we want, folks. It's about what Yahweh is doing in our lives, how he's working through us. That's true prosperity. I should point out also that it is possible for a person who's walking with Yahweh to go through testing and to feel like they're being cursed. For example, can you remember the story of Job? And Job's friends came to him and told him, you must have been really messed up because we're seeing the curses on your life. And really it was that Yahweh had withdrawn his protection for this testing period. So we must be very careful if we see a brother or sister going through um, trials, we don't just automatically assume, well, you're cursed. So obviously your, your doctrines must be wrong. Obviously you're not obeying the Torah in some way. We should pray for one another and not be judgmental, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In verse 18, we, we uh, learn that we'll take losses in our possessions. And also in verse 18, we'll have rebellious and unholy children. And uh, back up to verse 17, we will not prosper financially. So if you have these types of situations going on, these are evidence of demonic bondage in a person's life. Now, as Shauna just mentioned, it doesn't mean that Yahweh is not allowing you to suffer persecution for his righteousness for his righteousness working through you. That can happen in a sinful world. But if you have these things working in your life, what do you do? Do you just assume, well, well so-and-so, oh, uh, let's say, people in circumstances, verse 20, people in circumstances are just plaguing me. Oh, I'm trying to do everything right here, and I know I'm righteous, and everyone's just plaguing me. No one loves me, everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms. Okay, is that the right attitude? No. If this is happening, if people and circumstances are plaguing us, then what do we do? We're going to talk about this and formulate this idea throughout the Keys workshop. But may I suggest right up front, try praying Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O Yah, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And then stop and listen. Don't tell God what you know is wrong. Ask God what is wrong and listen, and he will tell you. Amen. He won't tell you what you already know. So, um, very interesting dialogue. Inherited bondage is found here in, in Exodus 34, 6 to 7. Yahweh passed by before him and proclaimed Yahweh, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and, and sin, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and to the fourth generation. So inherited bondage is the next one we're going to be looking at. Um, and obviously, if you are experiencing those curses from Deuteronomy 28, the first thing you do is some soul searching and prayer. So let's turn now in our workbooks to page 18. And we'll fill that one in together, dealing with inherited bondage. So on the right-hand side, it says demonic legal rights, legal rights. We need to understand that this is like a courtroom. That's why I mentioned yesterday that spiritual warfare has a lot to do with the courtroom. Yahweh says in Daniel that the Ancient of Days sits in judgment on the behalf of his people. This is a courtroom. And demonic legal rights gained in the parent lead to bondage in the child and of course, this brings a legacy of curses. Now, just to tell you how powerful the legacy is, David in the Bible, it says, was a man after Yah's own heart. That is quite a testimony. We know that David committed murder, not in that he killed Goliath, but rather in that he killed Uriah the Hittite. That was a, uh, the shedding of innocent blood. And um, so that, that made it so that Yahweh said he couldn't be the one to build the temple, in fact. However, David repented. He also committed adultery. David, like us, sinned. And in his case, maybe even some sins that we would look at and we would go, well, I could never respect that person's leadership ever again after that one. But um, Yahweh restored him. And, um, but he did experience some struggles, didn't he? However, because he was so repentant, that testimony of him that he was a man after God's own heart stood. And the Bible says that his son 
Solomon was reaping the blessings that David had earned in his walk with Yahweh. Solomon turned away from Yahweh. He had all these wives and he started following after their idolatry. And Yahweh said, I'm not going to take the kingdom away in your lifetime. I'm going to take it away in the lifetime of your son. Why? Because your sins are visited upon your son, but you are still reaping the blessings of David. Wow, if that as a parent doesn't drop you to your knees, I don't know. Don't you want your children to reap your blessings? Amen. What a powerful thing. And so this concept of legal rights that are gained through your freedom or through your bondage, they are passed down to your children in a legacy of what should be blessings, but it can be curses. It's also a way to shore up an idea of, of parents, grandparents, uh, even children. But I'm talking mainly to parents, grandparents, th those, any of you who have offspring off of you to realize this is a way of shoring up the idea that when you're being tempted, do you realize that whether you fall or stand to the temptation is bringing blessing or cursing to your offspring? Yeah. Do we realize that? When I think about that, that is a way, when I say shoring up, it's a way for me to shore up one more reason not to fall because I don't want to send anything onto my offspring except the blessings of Jehovah. Amen. Nothing less than the best. Yep. Amen. All right. So now we would like to show you some things that if practiced are so powerful that they definitely bring demonic oppression, if not possession on the children. So these are some of the uh, most spiritually dark, potent things that can be done. The first is the practicing of sorcery. Next is involvement in, relig in a false religion, idolatry. Many um, false religions are actually sun worship and things repackaged. And all of that form of idolatry is visited upon the next generation. Another one, rage, abuse, no self-control that is visited upon the children. Bad habits and addictions. There's a reason why um, th there's a syndrome, children of alcoholics. It's far more than just physical. Um, disobedience to <laughs> Yahweh's commands, of course, and being involved in secret societies. While you're filling that in, uh, bad habits and addictions, uh, just give you a quick story. Uh, when I was younger, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side had both of his shins broken out from DUI accidents. He had a real problem with liquor. And uh, my dad, has, when he became of legal age, started to drink, and then he stopped. He became a Christian and put it away. And I remember my dad sitting me down one day and talking to me. He says, Mark, we have the gene. Don't drink. He says, look at your grandpa's legs. And he says, I started to, and I recognized I could get out of control real quick. He says, we have the gene. Let's not go there. My dad recognized. He never said we had the generational bondage, but that's what he was, exactly what he was saying, is that there was a generational weakness that had been developed from my grandfather. And so I've never picked up any alcohol. I don't choose to do that. Why? Because I kind of like my legs the way they are. <laughs> <laughs> and I just saw... I saw in my grandfather somebody who really loved me, but he was limited in what he could do with me because he was harmed. Now, did God forgive him? Yes. But, you know, the accountability of having your legs broken and having one leg shorter than the other and not being able to run around the backyard with your grandson. I mean, again, you know, there's a lot of attributes that come on, but understanding that those generational Habits and addictions are not just what you're doing. Well, my sin is private. It's just mine. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I mean, there's a lot bigger thing going on here. Uh, just if you're part of a fellowship or you're fellowshipping, you're close friends and all this, uh, we're going to be talking about the transferred idea of those as well. But there's even an aspect of this that reaches over into outside the family, includes personal friendships, but that's later. 
Yeah. Perhaps um, I, the good news is that Yahweh delivers from this. Amen. And That's so it's in news. Isaiah 49, 24 and 25. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith Yahweh, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. What a beautiful promise that is. Now, uh, just as a quick illustration, one of the most potent story illustrations that I have heard on this subject was from a dear couple that lived in Idaho, and they were very conservative Christians, Sabbath keeping, and they had l decided to live off grid, and they went up to this high point of Idaho, almost into Canada, and they developed a home baking business where they baked in a stone oven, and they, they like I said, they lived off grid, and then they would take their bread down and they would sell it. Uh, once a week and they they were able to subsist off the land and the little bit that they needed to purchase more they got with the sale of their bread and um, anyway lovely couple and beautiful family and very sincere committed Christians and they became very concerned because the uh, their their oldest was five years old and the um, the the husband the the father had developed something on his on his neck and it was looking really not good and um, the wife was becoming more and more afraid that this could be something really serious and that maybe she might lose her husband and so um, they they tried all kinds of natural remedies and nothing was working and they were fearful that it was cancer and um, they were praying, and um, I believe it was because they were praying that um, God responded by giving them some information. One day, the wife was standing in the kitchen, washing the dishes in the kitchen sink. She was looking out the window that was right there over the kitchen sink, and, and she saw her husband walking across the, uh, the, the, the grounds there, and he was holding the little five-year-old boy's hand, and they were walking together, and um, it's just brought tears to her eyes as she realized that little boy could be without a dad soon. This was getting really bad. And um, I'm sorry, I said throat. It was actually armpit. Pa I apologize. Anyway, and it, it was cancer, by the way, and it was just getting bigger and bigger and everything they were doing, nothing was working. So um, anyway, she was praying and uh, had been fasting and praying. And as she was looking out the window at them, God spoke to her and he gave her just a download of information. He said, it is cancer and it's Satan. He's working to kill your husband. He has the legal right to kill your husband. And she said, wait a minute, how can this be? And what had happened is um, for the past generations going back at five years old, when, this, when the boy in the family, the oldest boy was five years old, the father of uh, going back to the grandfather had uh, committed adultery and the little boy had lost his father at five years old because the father had left the family having found some other woman. And that happened with his grandfather and that happened with the father and this man had given his life to God and he was determined not to do it. And the devil said, I still have the right to deny that five-year-old a father. And so they said, wait a minute, whoa. And so they got on their knees, they fasted and they prayed, they did an anointing similar to what we describe here in the Keys book. In fact, we were able to share with them some of the steps to take. And Yahweh completely was able to remove that thing that was in his armpit. But it would not until they dealt with it in, in this anointing level of prayer, it would not respond to any natural remedies because it was a spiritual malady and it would have killed him, absolutely. So the good news is God does deliver. You can't assume, oh, I was baptized, so all that Satan could ever do to me, it's over. <laughs> Please know it doesn't work like that. We mustn't take this ground for granted. It needs to be actually specifically reclaimed for Yah. The next area we'll be talking about is the cultivated bondage. In Proverbs 26, verse 11, it says, For as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And in Micah 2, 1, it says, Woe unto them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Cultivated bondage is what we get into all on our own. We follow the temptation, the weaknesses that happen as a result of it, the habits that are formed as a result. So cultivated bondage, simply put, is that which we have entered into in, our, in and of ourselves. Um, 
some people question uh, the idea of this and they say uh, in scripture it says that Yeshua was was tempted in all points like as we are but yet without sin was Yeshua ever tempted to play on a Game Boy on Sabbath you know a little play some computer games on Sabbath was he no, no. so he didn't they didn't exist so well well when how how was Yeshua tempted in all points like we are there's three primary areas of sin lust of the eyes lust of the flesh and the pride of life those are the three main areas of sin there's all kinds of subjected uh, uh, you know Manifest. breakdown of that afterwards but those every sin can fall into one of those three areas yeah. now on the converse side how many of you can turn stones into bread any of you I personally have made bread that turned into a stone, but that's different. So, okay. Mm, I hope that doesn't make me the Antichrist. Anyway, I'll oh, think Mark. about that later. So, <laughs> no. see, the temptation is tailor made to what you're able to do, not what you're not able to do, and not to what you are not tempted to do. Okay, so we all have our weaknesses. And so the cultivated bondage is, is the devil picking out your weaknesses and saying, oh, Mark, you have an issue with pride. I'm going to hit you with your pride. Oh, and what happens? Uh, my boy goes out in my garage and he misuses my tools and he didn't put them back. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> What's that going to do? How am I going to respond? Well, son. I appreciate you fixing this or working on that, but when you're done, I need you to put the tools away. Just wipe them off and put them back in the drawer you found them. That's all I ask. Okay, that's a correct response. A negative response, I react in rage. I get angry. I, I, I do something I shouldn't do. <laughs> I get mad at him and I, 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 I break his spirit. Say, you good for nothing, kid. Why did you ever do that? I don't know why you were ever born. You're just like your mother, would you not? Well, I wish she was like your mother. Anyway, anyway <laughs> that would be a good thing. Anyway, you get the idea. You, you know, you talk down to the child and you just destroy the child. Any self worth, any self confidence goes out the door. And what have you done? You've transferred your own generational, generational sin right onto him. But it's because of what you cultivated. So you cultivated anger. So as I, as a father, I've cultivated actually pride. Anger is an outlet for pride. We get angry because you hit, you stepped on my pride. How dare you? <laughs> you know, it's it's an issue I've had to deal with on my own. So we want to be careful not to be. I don't like this text in Proverbs. How many of you have ever seen a dog return to its vomit? I have. It's ugly. Have you ever thought about sin being that way? Do we see sin in the true light of what it is? It's horrible, and it's worse than that. It's actually worse than that. So we don't want to return to our folliness. Anyway, cultivated bondage is something we want to be very careful. That's what we start. And what we start goes on to the third and fourth generation, according to Scripture. So something we want to be very, very careful with. Mm -hmm. So here's a little illustration to show what happens with cultivated bondage and how bondage develops out of falling prey to temptation. At first, if you've ever been to a dam, like maybe Hoover Dam or some great big uh, dam, you will see that there's this huge wall and it's holding the water and, uh, and it keeps the water in doing very nicely as long as that dam is solid and strong. And so our um, will, our willpower to resist against a temptation is like the wall of the dam. It's very strong and, and the behavior is um, carefully and nicely contained within that wall of the dam. Now along comes the temptation and the devil hits us with that temptation. And if we use the heavenly weapons that we are going to show you how to use and what they are this week, then you can resist that temptation and it's gone. And what happens to the willpower to resist it next time? It stays in full strength, like the nice strong wall of the dam. However, if the temptation comes and instead we let it hang out and we kind of fantasize about it and we imagine it and 
whatever, then there's a little chink in our will to resist it. And the next time, maybe when it comes and hangs out a little longer, perhaps uh, we even might act on it. And that puts a further chink in our will to resist that temptation. We're weakening ourselves. And the next time, weaker still, and until we get down to the place where the behavior is coming through it in a torrent. And when it comes through in a torrent, there's no more dam to stop the water. There's no more willpower to resist. Now it's a compulsion. Okay. So that is how a temptation over time breaks down our ability to resist and goes to the point of a full compulsion. We need to remember that temptation itself is not sin. Uh, Hebrews 4 verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our, of our infirmities, but was on all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Who is our high priest? Yes, Yeshua. Yeshua. Was he tempted in all points? Yes. yes, but yet without what? Sin. sin. But he was tempted, so but he didn't sin. But he was tempted, but he didn't sin. But he was tempted. People start going, well, I keep being tempted, so I just may as well sin. No! That's you giving an excuse for not wanting to fight. And let's be honest. That's us being spiritually lazy. Yeshua was tempted, but he didn't sin. He didn't fall prey to it. He said, no, not my will, but thy will be done, Heavenly Father. Amen. He was Amen. hungry. 40 days of fasting. How many of you would want, to want some bread? A little nourishment. I would. I want it after two hours. 40 <laughs> days? Eesh. The temptation is not the sin. It's the yeah. thought. The devil brings the thought. And we have to remember the battle often begins where? In the mind. In the mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Yeshua HaMashiach. Oh. Every thought captive, no exceptions, every thought. Most thoughts, no. As soon as you say, well, this area is God's, but this area is mine. Closet sins, closet areas, no, these are my pets. I need to keep them. No, you don't. Hmm. That pet will kill you. Yeah. That pet will also, uh, that pet sin will not stay in the closet, folks. That pet sin will uh, it's like it's like varicose veins. They go everywhere. <laughs> they just reach out into every area of your life and take hold. And pretty soon, by the time you know what's happening, you're in a four alarm fire. Mm. So, so at what point then does a temptation turn into a sin? Well, we certainly know that sin is committed when we willfully break Yahweh's law. Uh, 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And James 4, 17 says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So we know that if we act in a way outside of harmony with Yahweh's law, it is a sinful act. But is action the only form of sin? Is it only sin if we act on it so we can have whatever fantasy life we want to have and it's all still fine and, and pure? And the answer to that is no. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Love doth not behave itself unseemly, it seeketh not her, her own, is not easily provoked, and thinks no evil. So we see that thoughts can be sinful, and in fact Yeshua tells us that the first conception of sin is in the mind, it's in the desire to do the sinful act. Matthew 5, 27 to 28 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her, what? In his heart. Already in his heart, yes. And so this is sins, temptation, um, when then does a temptation become a sin? Since Yeshua was tempted in all points like as we are, yet he did not sin. So here we have a little illustration to show how uh, at the moment where the thought becomes sinful. 
So we have little Johnny here and he wants to buy the rocket. He sees it in the toy store window and it's $10. I want to buy that rocket. And then he remembers, oh no, I only have $2. I can't buy the rocket, right? <laughs> Suddenly, and this thought is in gray because even though it sounds like his voice in his head, it's not his thought, but he thinks it is. Wait a minute. I could just take it. Okay, that was the temptation. Now Johnny's thinking, no one's looking. Taking it would be so easy. This is the moment of sin. Temptation was having that wrong thought flit across the mind. Sin was the moment it was allowed to hang out and expand upon it and develop it and get ready to do something with it besides resist it. See? Okay, so the moment of sin is the moment we uh, fantasize about it and allow it to hang out. Before it ever becomes a physical behavior. And yes, that is before we act upon it. The timing is absolutely critical. Satan hits us with well-timed suggestions put to us in the first person. We think there are thoughts when they're not. Uh, we talked about the fruit test, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. When we talked yesterday, when we talked about the fruit test, when we're hit with a temptation, sometimes the temptation comes to us in an ambiguous way, just as the serpent came to Eve in the garden. And we think, well, well, that's not really necessarily a bad thing. What are we doing right now? Justifying it. We're saying, well, whenever you get into the gray areas, be careful, folks, because you're probably not in a gray area at all. The devil's really good at trying to bring us there. So when we're... We're, we have these uh, well-timed suggestions put to us in the first person. We think it's our thought, and it may not really necessarily be a th sinful idea to begin with, but we have to test the fruit. And when we test the fruit, we say, is this going to bring me love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance? And we go through those fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians, and we say, no. And sometimes, you know, you don't even have to go through the list. You know, no, that's going to bring me carnality, not religiosity or more important uh, keep me in connection with my my savior so satan puts these temptations to us when we will most likely to succumb to them does he tempt us to be hungry when we're not hungry he is tempt us to overeat when we're not hungry does he attempt us to be angry when everything's going our way no see he knows well, but Mark, you're suggesting the devil can read our mind. No, I'm not. That's the secret place of the Most High. But I will tell you this, he's a master psychologist. He can read your body language. He can see your attitude. He can see how you're treating people. He can see how you're treating yourself. He can see what you're doing. And he will know what you're thinking based just upon the psychology of watching your body language. He's really, really good at it. So, but it will always come to you in the first person. So just a, a key up, just because you may think it's your thought, check it. Check it. Remember Satan's ultimate goal in tempting us? He wants to enslave us. Galatians 4, verse 3, even so, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Let's not be in bondage. Yah is come to set us free. Okay, take your uh, book and let's go to page 19. And we're going to track the process of how a temptation becomes an area of enslavement. So we begin with a thought temptation. The enemy implants a thought into your mind. <clears throat> and at that moment, that's just the temptation. But now what? Now we consider it. If we consider it, we are already chinking the will, putting a little chink in it. Failing to temptate, uh, falling to temptation weakens your will in this area, so the will will be continuing to get less and less gray, more and more down to white, like it's fading out. After considering it, then the next stage is imagination and fantasy. If you let the thought remain, you have sinned. So the thought comes, it's not a sin to have an evil thought, but if you let the thought remain, you have sinned. And the next stage then is desiring it. The stage after that is the single act. 
eventually you act on the temptation. And what's the next stage after that? Repeat to repeat it. Okay, we're going to go down to the lower part of the page here. Spiritual bondage develops as a bad habit forms until the next stage is to be enslaved. And we now come into the compulsion possession area. Satan, uh, Satan has a demonic stronghold in your soul. And um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5 says that he will help us to bring every thought captive to the obedience. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Yahweh to the pulling down of what? What's the word that's used? Strongholds. Strongholds. Yes, the Bible says that Satan can get strongholds. And bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. So when you hear the word compulsion and possession, what do you think of? You think of demoniacs running up to Yeshua, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> you know, in today's day and age, there is a lot of demonic bondage going on in our society, and medication is the answer. Huh. There are a lot of people who are on medications that all they really need, spiritual deliverance. I'm not going to say all. I'm not a doctor. I'm not even going to go there, but I will tell you, the folks that we've come across, too many of them, far too many of them are under spiritual bondage. They're in compulsion or possessions. They do evil things without even thinking about it. It's so ingrained. And it's because they've developed these habits. They've keep repeating the sin to the point where they're justifying it in their own mind as it not being sin. Who's become the God in their life? Jesus. They have, exactly. They're self-motivated, they're self-governed, they're self-driven, self, you're hearing a lot of self, and it's all about them. We have to get out of this ideology, and, and I appreciate the text that Shauna shared, because our Heavenly Father came to set all the captives free. We don't have to stay in the bondage of having compulsions or possessions. It, for those of you like me who have had to deal with anger in your life, you have to realize that that is a constant submission. If I didn't stay st constantly submitted, you know what happens? I'll fly off the handle. And my family knew it. Everyone around me would know it. And you just have to say constantly stay in subjection. No, not my will, but thy will be done. Okay, Heavenly Father, that didn't go the way I wanted it to, but I trust you. You know my time limitations. You know all this, you know, because I'm a time-oriented person. I, I want to I get up, I want to get things done, and I want to go to bed at a decent hour. And if you're not like that, um, that's just how I'm driven. I want to get the job done. I want to move on and get to the next thing. Maybe even have some time for some leisure time, spend with my family, play, you know, do something fun. Uh, work can be fun, but work to me is it's not fun. I tried that with my kids. They said, Dad, work's not fun. <laughs> said, Come on, we're going to go in the backyard and have some fun. We're going to mow the lawn, pull the weeds. Dad, this isn't fun. Yeah, didn't work. I tried it. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> when you have the compulsion or possession point, folks, you cannot get free in and of your own power. You need to ask somebody to pray over you. You need the freedom, and we'll be talking about the deliverance process later, but I'll, I'm telling you, there are areas in our life, there are sins that are so... Uh, fault areas that happen that they make such a chink into our armor that we have to depend on each other through God's power flowing through them to allow the Savior's will to be done in our lives. That makes us a bit dependent on each other. You know, you know what time, type of person Mark would be if I didn't have a check and balance in my life? Or me too. Yeah, I wouldn't be a good another. person. I'm appreciative of this young lady. She put me, Yahweh put her in my life because he knew she was exactly what I needed. Now, I can't say I always listened to her. 
and I pay the price. And I'm not saying she's always right, but I sure appreciate the other viewpoint. And if, if uh, you know, and, and most of the time when she speaks up, it's because she knows I need to hear her, but she never speaks to me in anger. Have you ever tried to provoke your wife to anger men? Don't raise your hand, especially if your wife's sitting with you. Wives, have you ever tried to provoke your husbands to wrath? Why? That's the one person in my life that I know that Yahweh's put in my life that I know she has my best interest in mind. If we miss that in our marriages and our relationships, you know what we've done? We've denied Yahweh's calling in our relationship. We've denied our calling. If we've denied our calling, who have we rejected? Have I rejected her? No, I've rejected my father's calling. Sometimes when we're in an area of compulsion and possession, we can't see it. Someone will try to come explain it to us, and it's just like we may as well just pull our hair out. We just don't get it. If you're in that situation, understand, you need to hit your knees in prayer. Because if someone's coming to you in love and respect and saying, look, and they may not say it the way we want, trust me, I know this. Rarely does Shauna say things the way that I want her to say them. She's kind about it, and that, that bothers me sometimes, depending on my mood. But I will say this, I appreciate that she's always approached me, and I see how she approaches others in a way that she herself would want to be approached. Now, I'm not lifting Shauna way up on a pedal still. This is my experience, okay? So she's part of my experience, so get over that. <laughs> anyway, for me, it has really helped me to see areas of compulsion and possession in my life that I needed deliverance from. And so we hit our knees, we go through the anointing prayer, and guess what happens? Deliverance. Should we expect anything else? No. And what are we waiting for? The only thing that can hurt me is if I go back to the dog vomit. Why would I do that? Why would any of us do that? But folks, my story is very similar to many of you here, many of you listening online. We keep returning back to it. God will have a people in the end of time that will hate dog vomit, <laughs> that won't put up with it. Say, sorry, no dog vomit allowed, Satan. Get out of here. In the name and power of Yeshua HaMashiach, no thank you. Amen. So in the first few sessions here, we have been focusing on really fully revealing how bondage happens. And you're probably wondering, okay, I see it. Now what do I do about it? And please know there's a few more steps to the expose process, but we are going to be going into what to do about it, just as in depth as we're going into the part of the problem. Okay. So that's what this series is about is that full, more deep unleavening. Now, what happens when Satan has a stronghold? What can he do with it? What happens to you? Um, well, the fact of the matter is he, he has a stronghold in one area, but he will use it to weaken you in others. You are, your spiritual potency is being sapped by having a stronghold. So it never works to say, well, there's only one at least that you know of, right? It's only one stronghold, so I guess I'm just going to keep that as part of the skeletons in the closet, and I'm not going to worry about it too much. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Any more than you can say, well, I just have one tumor, so I'm just going to ignore it there. What does the cancer tumor do? Grows and spreads and hits the blood. Oh, my, yes. In the same way, a spiritual bondage point, a stronghold, is like having a tumor. Yeah and you cannot ignore it, it does weaken you. It will also influence others around you, and Satan will use it to do that. And of course, he's radiating out of it in, in working to enslave you. And so just as I said, it spreads to other areas like a cancer. And so we need to remember 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. That is how Yahweh delivers us.
Are you seeing all the aspects of how sin just really enslaves us? Just it not only weakens us, it influences others in a negative way, it spreads like a cancer and enslaves you. It just, uh, it's amazing to me. If we saw sin in the light of what it really is, I don't think any of us would ever go there again. No, we wouldn't. All right. I'm going to read the verse. So we're going to, on our last page, uh, that I want to read that text, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for this is a spiritual fight. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning that we have spiritual weapons given by Yahweh for, his, for this spiritual battle. But instead they are mighty through Yahweh to the pulling down of strongholds, meaning that Yahweh gives us power through his weapons to pull down Satan's strongholds in our souls. Amen, right? Isn't that a blessing? Every stronghold Amen. is not a stronghold compared to the power of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's right. Casting down imaginations, that's Yahweh's power. That's meaning that Yahweh's power is great enough to reign in even the most out of control fantasy life and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Yahweh, meaning Yahweh cast down the demons who try to keep you from knowing the loving God, the loving Yahweh in completeness, fully in your life. Mm -hmm. Folks, that's called settling for good enough when all Yahweh's ever wanted for you is his best. Amen. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of what we think. Yeshua. No, to the obedience of what Yeshua, to him, because his will is the Father's will. He made it so. And what did Yeshua leave us? Yeshua left us an example that we should follow. Why? Because it's the only way out of this sinful mess. It is the only way out. Amen. He's a role model. Now, often when we do the Keys workshop, we are able to have volunteers from the audience read the review, and we actually have time to do it today. So we're going to use the roving mic and um, ask you to join us in the review process from the session three summary. So we need a volunteer to read the first bullet. And if those at the back would turn on that mic. Thank you, Yvonne. There are three dramatic changes. I don't think we have the mic yet. Number three, you were good, go ahead. There are three demonic chains which bind us to death. Inherited bondage, cultivated bondage, and transferred bondage, which is soul ties. Mm -hmm. All right, we need a volunteer now to read the next one. Go ahead, that's fine. When we have a demonic stronghold in us, we have completely lost our will to resist Satan in that particular area. Speaker. All right, thank you. Another volunteer. <laughs> That's all right. Well, we appreciate it. I'm just going to send it back. <laughs> Demonic stronghold. Give the enemy legal rights over us. Lost the mic. We lost the mic. One more time on that. Demonic. No. Three. She's on three. I'm not here. We're not hearing. Just Demonic. Maybe the mic got turned off. It's on. Did we lose the battery? No. Okay, we lost the battery. That's that's my fault. That's Mark's fault. Sorry, guys. Okay, so what mom was trying to say, demonic strongholds <laughs> give the enemy legal rights over us. We'll try this next time around. My yes. apologies. <laughs> and that Yeshua is in the business of breaking demonic chains. He also delivers our children. Isn't that Amen. good news? Amen. Amen. Isn't that good news? You see something going on in your children, guess what? Where do you start? Let's get the children. What? Yourself? Yeah, you better believe it. Yes. I'll tell you what. Raising our two children, 
when we saw something going on with them, Sean and I would go ahead to the bedroom. We'd have a private discussion. We'd sit down and we'd pray, Heavenly Father. We'd pray Psalms 139, 23, and 24. We also claim the text in Isaiah about Yahweh saving our children. Yes, amen. And we would start here. We would start here. We'll be dealing with that some more, Jeff. That's actually... Isaiah we, 49, 24, yeah, and 25. That's actually was in earlier in this session. And finally, the third, the, the, excuse me, the fifth summary bullet is my deliverance from these strongholds affects not only my life, but the lives of my children. God fights my enemy and saves my children. And by the way, how big is that? How long lasting? I'd just like to point out, consider the mistake that Abraham made in having a child with Hagar. Has that sin visited upon earth? <laughs> I mean, really, earth. We have the Middle East crisis as a result, don't we? So, um, yes, we want to walk in harmony with Yahweh's ways and praise his holy name. He can forgive us like he did with David. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, I can't because there's no mic, so we'll have to talk after. Let's, um, let's go to our closing hymn. Um, power in the blood. Would you stand with us and let's sing. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Joshua, your King? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Heavenly Father, again, we're grateful for showing us how the cultivated and inherited bondage is a, a fact in our lives, Heavenly Father, and the fallen nature. But I thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that you came to set all of us free through the atoning blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Heavenly Father. I just pray that you will make us all free, for your scripture says that if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Heavenly Father, as we focus on uh, these other areas uh, throughout this workshop, I pray none of us will get discouraged, but realize that our hope is in you. And as long as we have hope in you, Heavenly Father, our salvation is assured. To your honor and to your glory, we ask it and pray it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.